All right. Well, thank you for joining us. Um, we have a presentation here. It's going to take about 20 to 30 minutes. Um, and it, the topic is on using actuarial value to make HRAs and HSA plans work for your clients. Definitely a hot topic um, with a lot of new information that's just started to come out and more clarification um, on how these can be used. The states obviously are, are making recommendations and changes um, to how they're going to run their exchanges. And so obviously we're going to have to look at this on a state-by-state -state basis along with all the federal um, items that are being updated as well. But we're going to go ahead and get started on the information we have now because um, we believe this is definitely going to be something your clients are going to be looking at um, to try to help out. Um, as the timeline starts coming down the line here, um, we've got this uh, you know, ball in New York City that's going to drop. And, and we used a little bit of an illustration here to, to welcome us into 2014, um, really with the, the idea that that's going to be probably the opening moment of one of the biggest changes that all of us are going to see in our industry, maybe for um, the rest of our careers in it. Um, and so as the countdown starts to happen, it definitely starts to mark that point in time um, when exchanges go live and a lot of other things along the timeline um, uh, hit and, and um, make significant changes to our marketplaces. We've listed here just a couple of bullet points about some of the, the key changes that are going to happen um, and bolded a couple of other areas that are going to make significant changes to how clients are perceiving their benefits and maybe changes that are going to happen to them um, around costs. So let's just kind of go down those lists. And so the first uh, and biggest one is the insurance, um, insurance marketplace. The exchanges or the state exchanges are going live. Uh, whether the federal options are going to be able to be live by that point, um, that might be a little bit of a stretch but at least the, the state level one. So for the, the 18 or so states that have decided that they're going to be involved in the exchanges, those guys are moving fast and furious on uh, making this all happen. So January 1, 2014, those are live. And a lot of these things, I think, are going to be just more review more than anything. Um, individual mandate applies. So as the uh, Supreme Court ruled in June of last year, that it's a federal law that individuals must buy health insurance or qualifying plans. Um, and if they don't, then they're going to be assessed a tax penalty of about 90 bucks um, by not having that qualified plan or 1% of their income. Um, so that could you know, maybe affect some people more than others. Uh, but generally speaking, the first year isn't that much of a penalty for people to really react and go and buy coverage. But at least they'll have access to it. And they're certainly going to hear about it um, in October of this year, of 2013, that they have access to these, uh, these free premiums, I'm sure is probably going to be the tagline that they're going to use. And that gets down to the next bullet point that we've highlighted as well in bolded. For Americans who are um, earning less than 133% of the federal poverty level, um, those folks are going to be eligible now for Medicaid. Um, and that's, if you look at that, that's basically people earning about $14,000 for an individual or a family of four about $29,000. Um, some states are go ahead and are moving forward on taking the extension, which is going to move that 100% um, subsidy of the premiums in the exchange up to 138% of the federal poverty level. What this really means to employers, though, is, is that once a subsidy is issued, there's a trigger for an audit uh, by, the, by the state and the exchange that's going to be processed by the state. Um, those triggers are tax penalties, uh, potentially. And so obviously large group, uh, if you've been following all this, large groups are the only ones that can be treated with the tax penalty. But everybody's going to be audited because the subsidy trigger for the state police, what they've told me so far, is anybody that gets a subsidy, they're required by the feds to go ahead and check into it and make sure that um, there isn't additional penalties that need to be used for them to uh, subsidize the premium that's being provided. Um, so that, that's a big thing. Now, that extension and the Medicaid funding for the folks up to 133%, it's not permanent. It doesn't last forever. Um, so that it's really just a three-year uh, deal that the feds are working out with the states. And then it's going to drop down, uh, phase out to about 90% over the next couple of years. And then um, the states are really on their own to be able to try to supplement the differences in those, in those, in those uh, costs to them. Uh, some states are, are worried very much about this because they can't get a really good number of where that is going to actually end up and meaning what the costs are going to be to their states and the new costs that their states are going to have to have to be able to subsidize all those additional premiums. Um, and that may make them a little gun-shy knowing what their economy looks like. 
Um, others are just moving forward to go ahead and just do it and then try to figure out what's going to happen later. But for the employer, from their perspective, this penalty piece is a really big deal. Um, not only if they're small, well, large group for sure, but small group too, because you know, do they really want people coming in and checking on what's going on? Well, they're really not going to have the choice anymore. And then there's additional tax credits. So for those that are above 100% uh, of the federal poverty level, up to 400%, um, those folks can also have parts of their premium for, for individuals that buy plans inside the exchange to have parts of their premium subsidized. Okay. Um, it's kind of, uh, if you want to use the word fiscal cliff, it's much of like a fiscal cliff that the folks at 133% or 100% subsidized, uh, and then it drops significantly down to the full 100% level. And there's a lot of calculators out there. Kaiser Family Foundation's had one for a number of uh, months that, that provides a pretty good idea, a snapshot of what it's going to look like um, uh, for folks. And, you know, it, it might be something to look at for yourself just to get an idea, or at least to recommend to folks that are trying to figure this whole thing out and what it's going to mean. Um, annual limits on insurance coverage is eliminated. Um, the reason why we bolded this is that it does have a significant impact on how HRAs are used today. Um, and the new guidance that came out last week around individual um, policies are not able to be funded with an HRA any longer. Um, I put the link there to the Department of Labor's website that specifically calls out that information. If you haven't read it, I would recommend doing so because there's a lot of clients that were considering the idea of defined contribution and getting out of the health benefits business. Um, and now if they're planning on doing that, they're definitely going to have to go to plan B, um, which they're going to need your help to figure out. But what that basically means is that an HRA by itself um, has limits, but with an health care reform, um, health plans or group plans cannot have limits. Um, the significant piece though with an HRA is that if you combine a group plan with an HRA, meaning a group medical plan with an HRA, those two benefits together are considered integrated and therefore can be used in the exchange. Whether the plans are going to be used or there's going to be a lot of different product options as far as plans, uh, we don't know 100% um, yet, but we do know that the essential benefits calls out for caps of the deductible of $2,000. So that could be a significant impact to the employer as well. Pre-existing conditions go away when in, in, um, enrolling in individual insurance um, and policies are guaranteed issue. This is a big deal for costs, for premiums. Um, and for people to be able to get access to care. And then there's also a small business tax credit um, that some of us have seen. Um, there's, I believe, about less than 4% of the population of the employers were actually able to get any of that money. Uh, but that's supposed to be increasing a little bit, but it's also a limited term option for employers to get in to buy health coverage and then have, they're going to have to fully subsidize it themselves after a couple of years. Okay. So these are a couple of the timelines, and again, after New York City drops that ball, that are going to be live and active um, and moving forward where we really can't change. We can only help with uh, trying to find solutions for what the employers are looking for. Um, and we mentioned earlier the triggers for these tax penalties, and it really all hinges on affordability. And this is specific more to large group than it is to small group. Um, large group is those folks that are 50 plus employees or more. Um, but healthcare reform has this trigger now that they need to be able to subsidize the premiums that are being subsidized in the exchange, and they're subsidizing that through tax penalties to the employers. Okay, um, but it's really important now to define what affordability means because in the past most employers, you know, have had the question, well, how what what coverage do you have? And they'll say, well, we've got a copay and, and X deductible. Um, employees aren't are going to have to turn or going to start to get used to using different terminology that's tied to what means what affordability means. And it no longer really is the deductible or the premiums or those types of things. Okay? It has all those components included, uh, but it's not specifically the item that they're going to be looking at. Um, here's just the Webster's Dictionary of what affordable means. Um, adjective, that it can be afforded, believed to be one's financial mean. So that's very interesting if you try to use the logic there on who one is um, in the ACA world, usually one means and only means the individual, um, individual, not the employer. And the noun of that is usually affordable, it's items, expenses that one can't afford. Um, and how one can't afford is, is defined in healthcare reform in bullet three and four. Again, back to what the employee can pay in, 
and pay for, what the federal government saying the employee can uh, pay for, is that the employee's contribution to their own single coverage cannot exceed 9.5% of their W-2 wages for that employer. Okay? That's affordable. So anything under 9.5% of those employee-only premiums, that contribution is considered affordable. The second one is actuarial value. Actuarial value of the group plan cannot, uh, must be 60% or more. Um, actuarial value is what we're going to talk about here in just a second, but just note that any time that bullet three or four is not achieved by the employer, then that plan is considered unaffordable. All right? So actuarial value. You might have heard of this term. I'm sure you have. It's not really new news. It's the, the, really the question is how do we communicate it um, and help employers understand that you really can't evaluate it based off deductible, coinsurance, and copays because it's the entire block of things that um, makes it uh, of what they need to value or evaluate. Um, what actuarial value is defined to, to be is it really just measures the percentage of claims an insurance carrier pays versus a member, not an individual member, but the members, okay? Um, it's not based on premiums. So you can't really just associate it to that. I already mentioned the fact that it has nothing to do with individual claim evaluation either, meaning that one single person's use of a deductible or a copay or coinsurance or all those together is not the actuarial value. It's the total evaluation of the plan, okay? Which includes copays for office visits, prescription drugs, deductibles, and coinsurance. Um, and there's just an example here of an office visit charge. And, and this might be one way to describe it to an employer is that if we're looking at all of the claims and if an office visit charge was 100 bucks and the carrier's paying 60 of that on average, meaning that the member's paying the other 40, that plan is considered to have a 60% actuarial value. To simplify everything, um, there's these metallic plan names that are coming out. So really what an employer is going to have to start saying that they offer uh, to their clients, or meaning that their employees, they're, they're going to need to start saying, well, we have a bronze plan, or we have a silver, or a gold, or even a platinum plan. There's a little typo there on the bottom. But the actuarial value is 60%, meaning that, again, the, the carrier is paying about 60% of the charges. That is considered a bronze plan. The actuarial value of 70% is a silver level plan, 80% gold, 90% platinum. Okay. So these are the new evaluations or measuring sticks that employers are going to have to start using so that they can communicate clearly to their employees because when the employees hear free, they're going to go online. And when they go online, they're going to be looking at plans that are labeled bronze, silver, gold, and platinum. Okay? And then they're going to go to their advisor and they're going to say, well, I want a bronze plan. And then we're going to have to be able to accommodate for that and then dig into the plan and how it applies to them. Because okay, that's really what the new marketplace looks like now. So why is actuarial value and affordability important? There's a couple of key bullets that we put in here for that. Um, the first is, is that when an individual is buying coverage from, an, from the exchange, they're only going to be able to be subsidized based off the silver level plans. Right? They can buy bronze, that's fine, but there's no subsidy. They can buy gold and they can buy platinum, but they're going to have to pay the difference between what the silver plan is subsidized by to what that buy-up or that gold or that platinum plan is. There are catastrophic plans out there for younger individuals up to 30 years old. Okay? Um, but those are kind of some of the key items there around um, why actuarial value is important because employers are going to need to say, well, we have at least a silver level plan if they're going to try to compete with the exchange. They can buy a bronze, but their employees are going to be looking at the silver. And if they're looking at the silver and they're subsidized by those, then they might leave the plan meaning triggering the audit and or the penalties to the employer. So that kind of becomes the new baseline. Uh, employers labeled as small group will only be able to offer the metallic plan options. Okay. What we're finding is, is that the product options, meaning like these higher deductible plans, $5,000, $7,500, $10,000 deductibles that are out there, um, may not or really are not going to be available inside or outside the exchange for small group. Uh, multiple states have come out and said that the only options that are going to be available are just the fully insured options at $2,000, which has to do with the essential benefits um, and all of the other items that are involved in there too, meaning the $3,200 um, coinsurance or cap of the, the um, $5,600. Okay. 
If an employer large, uh, if a large group employer does not offer an affordable plan, and again, remember, it gets back to the W-2 amount of 9.5% or less, or having at least a 60% actuarial value plan, um, then that employer will be assessed a $3,000 non-tax deductible penalty per individual that goes in the exchange and is subsidized. Okay? It's not always bad to offer a plan that's not uh, qualified or potentially that the employees can go in and get subsidies so that there's a tax penalty to the employer, uh, but they certainly are going to want to know that when they're making those plan choices. And really, they're just basically trying to figure out uh, the consequences because a non-tax deductible expense really isn't $3,000 or 250 bucks a month. It equates to a much larger number um, to the employer when it has to do with their own taxes um, and, and what they were able to write off in the past. So something to, to consider and, and quantify for that employer. Um, so, that, so those are a couple of the key bullets. And the last one there that's bolded is can an HRA, HSA option be used to create improved actuarial value and affordability? Um, I'm assuming you might have seen the answer to this. Uh, oops, sorry. But the answer to this is yes. Okay. And I'm going to go ahead and flip here to the next to the guidance here. There's a question that came in, so I'm going to take a look at that real quick. So the question came in is, 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 is an employer is offering a bronze or 60% actuarial value benefit and the coverage is affordable, meaning that they're also making sure that the employee is paying less than 9.5% of the W-2 income. The point of clarification here is, is that the employee would not be eligible to receive a subsidy. So they can still go to the exchange, they just have to pay for it 100% and, and know that they would have to use also post-tax dollars. Okay? So maybe they don't have to offer a silver level plan, but um, if they're trying to compete at that level, it, it, it might be important. And, it, and that might get back to why the employers even offer benefits in the first place. Um, this guidance that you're seeing here, it's, a, it's, it's most of the text that has to do with actuarial value and high deductible health plans combined with HRAs and HSA style plans. Um, and just, you know, I, I'm going to actually share all the different, um, all the slides here with you once we get done with this so you can read through them if you'd like. Um, but it, it goes into full detail about how the HRA and the HSA is considered part of a group plan or an integrated part of the plan but it also mentions that the full benefit of the HRA must be evaluated as well as with the HSA, uh, meaning that if you have a $5,000 fully insured deductible plan today, a lot of employers and, and brokers have considered an HRA that has a $3,000 reimbursement of that deductible to mean that the employee has a $2,000 deductible in actuarial value because you're estimating how much people are actually utilizing the benefit that full $3,000 benefit that I just mentioned with the HRA does not equate. Okay, it's actually much less than that. It's more around a $3,000 benefit instead. Okay, or $3,000 deductible instead. Okay, so you actually are going to have to have maybe a $1,000 um, or $4,000 HRA benefit so that once that all washes out in actual value, it's calculated that it's in the correct area. Okay, basically over buying or over offering the benefit. Um, we at Post our benefits um, have actual uh, have actuaries that work for us, and so um, what we've been doing over the last couple of months, and, and really over the last year, is putting together um, actuarial value certifications. And so these are just some examples of some plans that we've done recently. So I wanted to give you an idea of what it looks like for an employer, so that it might give you some some basis off of your clients and what they might be having to deal with, um, good or bad or indifferent. Uh, because once they know that they have the actual value it, it, in, in the ballpark of what they need to hit, they also have to pay for it, which is the next challenge. Um, the first bullet there talks about a $2,000 deductible, $3,000 coinsurance. That actual value is considered a silver level plan, okay, because you're at 70% or more. Then you have the same $2,000 deductible, same $3,000 coinsurance, but in this case, the HRA reimburses $1,500 of the deductible, and $1,000 of the co-insurance, that takes it up to a gold level plan. Do they need to do that? Maybe, maybe not. You know, it really just depends upon the market and why the employer is offering the plan. What's interesting though, if you look at the third bullet and you see a, a fully insured $750 deductible plan with a $3,200 co-insurance, that is considered a, is a, is a silver level plan. So if the employer is trying to compete 
you have two employers, one that has a fully insured deductible at $2,000, but this $1,500 reimbursement of the deductible, and 1,000 of the co-insurance, they're able to actually market their plan as a gold level plan versus the other employer that's marketing their plan as a silver level plan. Is that important to the employee? Uh, you know, devil's in the details, but I would think so. Okay, and then the last bullet shows a $5,000 or $500 deductible, $2,000 co-insurance, and that gets you to a gold level plan, 81%. Okay, um, kind of interesting. Ran across this slide and just wanted to share it with you as well. This actually came from Insurance Care, and what they were trying to do is, is show some options of what a bronze, silver, and gold level plan would look like. Um, and how it accounted for its actuarial value. So in their example, they used the $2,000 deductible there in the middle for the bronze. Um, the max out of pocket is, is stuck at $6,200, $6,250, okay? Uh, that max amount of pocket is not co-insurance only. It includes your deductible, includes your co-insurance, it includes your office visit co-pays, it also includes your, your uh, prescription drugs as well, okay? So much different than what you consider right now max amount of pocket because a lot of times that doesn't include the RX probably is, is a biggie and maybe office visits too. Um, and then it broke. Then this care broke down down below the percentages of coinsurance and copays for the different services. So this bronze level two thousand dollar deductible plan had a fifty percent coinsurance, office visits of forty five dollars, and then look at the prescription drugs. It's really a generic only type plan. Um, and then you're selling to the employer that they could go to a 50% prescription drug on preferred and non-preferred brands. That might be a tough sell for a lot of employers. And then you show the silver plan and the gold plan. Okay, a couple different options there. But I think it's good to highlight these are maybe potential the plans that we're going to start to see. Okay. Always want to mention two health savings accounts because, again, they also, the employer contributions towards the HSA or the health savings account, that contribution plus the high deductible health plan, those two benefits integrated and combined creates the overall actuarial value of the plan. The challenge is, is that with actuarial value, you deal with HSAs. Um, remember, you're talking plan percentage of payment of the, of the claims versus member plan payment of the claims. Um, and you run into a little bit of an issue there because you've got a 100% member payment versus nothing from the, the carrier until they meet their deductible, then you've got a percentage after that. Um, and so HSAs predominantly have a much lower actuarial value. Um, some of the estimates that are out there believe that they're below 50% on average uh, because a lot of times the deductibles are above $3,000 which we do need to remember is that those plans for small group most likely won't exist in 2014. They can't even be filed by the insurance companies. Okay, So if they have an actuarial value right now of 50%, it might go up, but then you're also paying more in premium. But you know there is definitely a lot of HSAs out there. In fact, there was a study that just came out um, recently that said there's over 8 million of these accounts open today with about $15 billion of assets. So there's a lot of money in these HSAs. So to think that they're going to go away immediately at exchange time, um, I don't think that that's true because they definitely still fit into the mix. Um, what the plan options are going to be available may limit them, though, Okay, because the concept is going away of why they were offered. So um, just something to consider, okay? Um, and, and the one thing that we definitely like to talk a lot about is that employer, employers really have an, an, a need, and the need is really around coming to the conclusion of why they offer benefits. I've had this conversation quite often over the last year, and it's been interesting to hear the answers that have come from the employers. Many of them have no re understanding why they even offer benefits. They just think they have to, and some of them even respond saying they're required to. Um, which creates a little bit of a tough conversation to have um, because obviously they're not, but they, um, but they could run into penalties in the future if they don't. So these are all new pieces of information because there's a certain point that if it was free, it would be, you know, everyone would have it, but if it costs, you know, a million dollars per employee, there's, most companies can afford that, okay? So they're going to have to put a value in what offering benefits are, and they're going to need their insurance brokers and consultants and agents to help them understand here's the options I have available to you based off of that price, okay? Because there's an intangible value that they have to be able to quantify into the premiums. 
and then that becomes what is affordable to them. Okay, so I think that's super important to know, maybe for the future of, of what you do in your business um, and who the clients are that are likely to be around, but there's definitely a lot of um, concern um, because this is a reality, and now there's other options that employees can look at that, again, create triggers for tax penalties and audits. Um, a lot of times the resistance from employers to become compliant has been, well, show me the penalties and show me how often it's going to be happening. Um, we know that there's a significant portion of, our, of the U.S. that does not have insurance, and they are definitely going to be going to the exchange, and they're going to either be fully subsidized or partially subsidized, and those states have to audit. Okay? So the employer wants to be able to protect themselves, and they need, again, their broker to help them do that. Um, some of the questions that we ask, you know, also, you know, beyond that of the why is, is does the employer want to offer the best benefits, meaning a platinum plan, plan, or do they need to, right? I mean, is there unions that are involved, or is there other employee contracts that they need to come in into play? Um, this might be a little bit down the line and maybe too far down the line for some to consider, but it's definitely something to consider when you're dealing with negotiating union contracts that are multiple years, that the Cadillac tax is going to be a big-time reality. Okay, and if you're not quite sure what that is, what it means is that there's a certain limit that the, that the employer can pay towards premiums. Any amount above that, there's a 40% excise tax that, that is value, or evaluated or in, in issued. That's a carrier tax, unless it's a self-insured plan, but everybody knows that that's just going to get pushed through into the premiums. Okay? Does the employer use a traditional plan set? I mean that they just have a fully insured group plan today. Um, well, that's that's good because then there's definitely some alternative options that are going to be available, um, but it also matters on what is their, their benefit level today because those plan options may not be av uh, available in the future, and if they're not available, then how much is it going to cost for them to buy up to those other options um, where they may start looking at an, an HRA or an HSA combination type of plan. And who will certify the plans in the, in the case of an audit? Because if you do have an HRA or an HSA style plan that the employer has, has set up and, and integrated with another group plan. Um, state exchanges are going to be doing these audits, so there's def, you know, you're going to need to answer the question, well, how are the subsidies going to be um, audited, and what information will the exchange, state exchanges accept around actuarial value? Um, CMS came out with its own actuarial value. It's very, very difficult to operate. In fact, I haven't found very many people have been able to function through the whole thing yet. Um, but there's definitely services out there that can help you and, um, and provide that service to your clients. Okay. Um, we're right at 1029, so it looks like we um, hit the mark as far as timing. Um, we want to be available to answer questions as we can, so please use that question box in the bottom right, um, or feel free to get a hold of us. Oops, sorry about that. Go back to that. Um, we're on a lot of different social options around Facebook and Twitter and LinkedIn and all those types of things. Email, you should have an email to get a hold of me um, or even at least a phone call too. Um, so we're definitely available to help out there. So I really appreciate the time and um, appreciate the feedback too. So have a great day and 